<laughs> you can start the session, Doctor. Okay, fine, excellent. So, uh, good evening, respected seniors, colleagues, and all the wonderful and dynamic residents who have logged in for today's class. So, it's give, uh, it gives me, you know, immense pleasure uh, to welcome you all for the inaugural uh, master class of the online postgraduate teaching program, uh, which we have named Kaksha. Uh, Kaksha is a novel PC teaching program envisioned by Rajasthan Ophthalmological Society, uh, which will actually cover all the major topics over a period of next two years. Uh, covering uh, the current curriculum of postgraduate ophthalmology residential program in India. We'll be bringing the best of national and state faculty experts to share the knowledge and interact with you. The residents are also encouraged to put forward all their doubts in a fearless manner and interact freely with the faculty. Coming to the class, <clears throat> we have today with us Dr. Krishna Prasad sir from M.M. Joshi Eye Institute, Karnataka to enlighten us about the most important and uh, frequently ignored topic of refraction. Actually, this class will be covered in two parts and it's a large topic. The basic refraction will be covered today. And next week, he'll be talking, uh, taking the class on applied refraction. Just a brief intro of Dr. R. Krishna Prasad. He's one of the directors and head of pediatric ophthalmology and glaucoma services in M.M. Joshi Eye Institute. Uh, uh, M.M. Joshi Institute is a premium super specialty institute of North Karnataka. He completed his MD from the prestigious RP Center Ames with honors. He is the director of postgraduate training and fellowship programs at M.M. Joshi I Institute. And uh, postgraduate training is very close to his heart. He has been the chairman scientific committee of Karnataka Ophthalmic Society and the editor of its journal. He has undergone a fellowship training in pediatric ophthalmology from the Storm Eye Institute, uh, North, uh, South Carolina, USA. And uh, Education, education has been the passion of Dr. K.P. sir. He has been a postgraduate teacher for the past 25 years. And he is a member of EIUS Postgraduate Education Committee also. And a regular guest faculty in all the national level and state level postgraduate classes. So, we welcome you, sir, Dr. Kishpada, sir, to Rajasthan of Thalmic Society uh, to enlighten us about your knowledge of interaction and to inculcate a sense of learning and interaction amongst RPGs also. <clears throat> I would like now to welcome our esteemed panel here also, comprising of our president, sir, ROS, Dr. Kamlesh Khilnani, Dr. Sanjeev Desai, sir, president-elect, Dr. Virendra Garwal, vice president, Dr. Gulam Ali, our dynamic secretary of ROS, Dr. Hashul Tak, our treasurer, and uh, the various HODs uh, of Rajasthan, Dr. Rakesh uh, Purwal, sir, head of the department, JLN Medical College, Ajmer, uh, Dr. Jayashree, head of the department, Gordon Medical College, Kota, Dr. Lakshman Jhala, head of the department, Udaipur and Institute. Dr. Pankaj Sharma, sir. Four residents are here, four or five residents are here on the hot seat today. Uh, Dr. Rashtri, Dr. Ayushi, Dr. Sangam, Dr. Babita, <coughs> and others also. Uh, Dr. Krishna Prasad has a list uh, with him. Keep a strong vigil as there are two grand prizes to in every class. Uh, I now hand over the proceedings of the class uh, to the dynamic secretary, Dr. Gulam Ali. Can you unmute yourself and start? Yeah, yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Krishna Prasad and uh, all participants on the behalf of uh, Rajasthan Ophthalmological Society. And uh, I'm very thankful to Visar Lagarwal for the, this uh, uh, unique idea of Kaksa uh, for the PG students. And I hope uh, it will go very well uh, uh, in coming two years. Uh, now I request our uh, president, Dr. Kamlesh Kilani uh, to start this uh, program and uh, say a few words. Kilani sir, are you here? Sir, I think he has not joined yet, but we can request Dr. Krishnabhata sir to start his class because... Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So you can unmute yourself. Sir, please start. KP sir, you can unmute yourself now. So, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Vishal and all my friends at Rajasthan for having me uh, in this uh, wonderful program. It's a very novel idea and a very 
a useful idea for post graduates to bring in to table all the uh, uh, I mean required information in a uh, interactive format. So we are starting with refraction. And with your permission, I would like to start my presentation, share my screen. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes, sir. We can see your screen and we can okay. hear it clearly. Okay, fine. Vishal, uh, Vishal uh, Kamlesh yes, uh, just joined me. Sir, can we just take a 30 second break? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Okay. You want okay. me to stop sharing? No, no, the no, 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 sir. No, no, sir. Yeah. Sharing can continue. Okay. And no, you can probably, Dr. Kilani can probably put in a word before I start. No problem. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kilani, sir, uh, good evening, sir, uh, to the Kaksha program. Sir, sir, sir. Okay. Kamal to kill hai, na? <laughs> <laughs> I think he has some problem. So you start the class. We'll, you know, okay, problem. So no I'll problem. I'll come to Dr. Kilani in between. No problem. No problem. You think, start uh, the class. Uh, friends and my postgraduate students. So see, it's very commonplace and understanding all of us that we know that you know practice. We have a patient who's very unhappy because we prescribe glasses for him in his complex refraction. He's not very happy at all. And we do a cataract surgery, and the patient is sometimes unhappy because of a refractive surprise. And we don't really don't know where we went wrong. When we choose a patient for a multifocal eye hole and the patient is not really happy because he didn't get the expected vision and he has some issues because probably we figured out uh, something wrongly during the calculation. Or sometimes we prescribe glasses to an end patient and she comes back and says that after wearing the glasses, her squint, which was not there so far or very probably intermittent, has become very obvious to her, uh, to, I mean, her friends. So, like that, we have patients who want refractive surgery and they come and ask us, am I, uh, you know, okay for taking, I mean, uh, uh, take a deeper the refraction, refractive surgery or not. So, there are so many things in our day-to-day -day practice that involves an understanding of refraction. I think for uh, most of the postgraduates, first thing first, it's very important to understand that refraction is very important for the exam. Okay, so in the exam, the idea, I mean, or if you are uh, ignorance about basic refraction can be very costly for very right reason, because you have only the examiner to face in the exam, but in our practice, when you pass out and come into the practice, the patient becomes the main examiner and there you are clear idea about refraction. You may say that you may have auto refractometers or you may have optometrists, you have hired them, but having an idea about refraction is something which is very, very in the cornerstone in the proper, you know, uh, helping your patients to get a satisfied uh, vision. At the same time, troubleshooting when your auto refractometer optometer is not working optimally. So I think this is the uh, most crux of the issue. And I would like to really go through some of the basics. We have a lot of postgraduates on this platform. So it will be an interactive class. It's called Kaksha. So let it actually look like a classroom only, even though we are sitting virtually at it. So I'll be basically sharing some of the practice guidelines in refraction. So when you have a refract, I mean, you, when we discuss about refraction, we always first talk about what is called as the objective refraction or what we call as the retinoscopy. So retinoscopy and acceptance is a very important part. And uh, most of the postgraduates are here. So I would like to really uh, take that their presence so that it becomes an interactive class and we can also have some questions. The, the very, I, I mean, idea of having them here is to understand what does a, I mean, a PG want? What is their understanding? So that we can actually, every mistake done by them in this interaction will be a teaching opportunity. So when you have a uh, thing like this, so you normally have a retinoscopy that is given like this. Okay. So Dr. Ayushi, when you have a retinoscopy cross given to you like this in the exam, so yes, it's sir. plus two at 90 and plus three at uh, 180 degrees. And they ask yes, you to give, give me the acceptance. What will be your answer, Dr. Ayushi? So first we need to know the working distance and the cycloplegic used. Exactly. So that's a very pertinent thing. So you just cannot give the acceptance based on the retinoscopy value. You need to know at what distance these readings have been recorded and also the amount of cycloplegia because accordingly we do it. So the working distance is two third meters and it's a dry refraction. We have not used any cycloplegia. 
So, can you tell me what is the acceptance of this? A surplus zero point five zero diameter sphere plus one point zero diameter cylinder at ninety degree. So oh, perfect. So Dr. Aishi scores it really well. So the idea is that whatever is the two meridia that you have, so you need to subtract the working distance and the cyclopedia. So it's a two third meters. Mean you need to subtract one point five. It's a dry refraction. So nothing from the cyclopedia. So you subtract one meridian only from one meridian minus one point five. So plus two plus two minus one point five. That becomes the sphere. So it's very important, PGs, to understand that we don't have to subtract from both the meridia. One meridian you subtract, that becomes the sphere. Okay, and the difference between this to this becomes the cylinder. And since it has to act at one eighty, we need to put it as ninety. So as Dr. Aishi said, it is plus point five after sphere. Plus one diameter cylinder at ninety degrees. It's not enough here. You need to tell what is the type of astigmatism. Can you tell me what is the type of astigmatism that is in this? Uh, so compound hypermetropic. Yes. Anything else? Uh, so with the rule, with the rule astigmatism. So that's see. This is plus sphere plus cylinder. So both are plus. Then it is a compound hyperopic. Okay, it is so. It's a compound hyperopic astigmatism. As far as with the rule or against the rule is concerned, you need to understand minus cylinder at one eighty and plus cylinder at ninety becomes with the rule. To get the point, so yes, minus at one eighty plus at ninety. So what is this, Doctor Aishi? So compound hyperopic with the rule astigmatism. Exactly. So this is with the rule astigmatism. So you can remember one and try to figure out the other. So minus cylinder at one eighty, which is also equal to plus cylinder at ninety, is with the rule. So you need to write in the exam compound hypermetropic astigmatism with with the rule astigmatism. Okay. So now uh, let me go to Doctor Ishita Agarwal. So here, what you what question you want to ask Doctor Ishita? Is she around? Or can we have Dr. Babita? Dr. Babita is around. Okay, Dr. Aishi, you yourself can answer. What is the? <coughs> I mean, what what question you want to ask me? Sir, the working distance and the cyclopedia. Okay, <laughs> so it's one meter and dry refraction. So you want to subtract how much? You need to tell. Don't write it. You just tell me how you work it out. Sir, Sangam is here. You can ask Dr. Sangam also. Okay, right, right. So that was coming to them next. Uh, So, Dr. Sangam, can you tell us what is the uh, acceptance of this, Dr. Sangam? Sir, first we have to minus minus one from one meridian for yeah. working distance, and okay. as it is a dry refraction, we don't have to minus the cycloplate. Okay. Maybe. So, what is the acceptance now? Can you tell me the acceptance? Should not take too much time. It's a very simple mathematics arithmetic. So let's go from here. So it's plus two one meridian. Let's take plus two. You subtract one from plus two. It becomes plus one. So the sphere is plus one sphere. So the cylinder. What is the cylinder? That is a very important thing. Everybody will know the sphere, but the cylinder is how much? The cylinder is minus five. Five. At Ninety degrees. Ninety okay. degrees. Okay. So how did we arrive at that? So this is something. So it's plus one sphere minus five cylinder at ninety degrees. So let me just tell you, we have plus two here, we have minus three here. You always have a problem, trouble finding out whether it is, you know, it's five diopters, which is plus or minus, and where to put it. So I will simplify this question by trying to give you an idea about the number line. So in the mathematics. You know that there is a number line zero in the center, plus one, plus two, plus three on this side, minus one, minus two, minus three on the other side, right? They move away from zero. So if you want to go from plus two to minus three on the number line, you need to go towards the negative side five units, right? So from plus two to minus three, if you want to reach, it has to be five units along the negative side. So you need to put it as minus five. So, if you have any doubt about what is the sign of the cylinder, think about the number line, and if it is going towards negative, then it is minus five 
So, Dr. Sangam, can you tell me what is the type of astigmatism? Sir, it's a mixed astigmatism. Very good. It's a mix because there's a plus one and minus here. So, it's a mixed astigmatism. Anything else that you want to tell me? Is it with the rule or sir, against the rule? Sir, it is against the rule. Against the rule. Perfect. So, I told you minus cylinder at 180 is with the rule. Minus cylinder at 90 is against the rule. So, it's a mixed astigmatism and an against the rule astigmatism. Okay. So now, I think I'll uh, pass the question to Dr. Sangam only. So can you tell me what is correct in ABCD? Or anybody else can answer. Anybody who's watching this can tell you what is the answer. It's ABCD. So what is the answer? So answer C. B or C? C, C, sir, C. C, C for Calcutta, right? Yes, sir. That is K for Calcutta now, actually. So, so let's say now the working distance is two-third meter, that is 66 centimeter. So it is minus 1.5. Atropine is one diopter. So you have to subtract minus 2.5. So if you subtract 2.5, so this will be the answer. So if you subtract plus 2.25 to minus, so if you subtract minus 2.5 minus from plus 2.25, the answer will be minus 0.25. So either it's C or D. And if you go from plus 2.25 to minus 1.75, you have to go towards the negative side around 4 diopters. So it is at 90. So the answer is C. Right? So the answer is C. So if this is the answer. And now... It's a very simple thing. I will not ask any anyone. I'll just try to solve it for you. Home atropine, you subtract half diopter. Two-third meter is 1.5. So you need to subtract minus 2. So minus 2, minus 2. It becomes minus 4. And you go from minus 2 to minus 3 towards the negative side, 1 diopter. So it is minus 4 sphere, minus 1 cylinder at 90 degrees. Dr. Sangam, what is the type of astigmatism once again? Sir, it's compound myopic. Compound myopic with or against the rule? Sir, it's against the rule. Against the rule. Perfect. So now you have an oblique. Sometimes you have these oblique lines. So they are given once, one meridian only. You need to figure out the other meridian which is perpendicular to it. So if it is two third meters and dry refraction, so two third meters you have to subtract 1.5. So if you subtract 1.5 from 2.25, it will be plus 1.5. And going from here to here will be minus 5.25 along the negative side. And that has to act along this direction. Means the perpendicular of 135 will be 45. So it will be plus 1 sphere minus 5.25 cylinder at 45 degrees. So this is the... Uh, what kind of astigmatism is this? Any, any guesses? Anybody? It's a mixed astigmatism. Oblique. Oblique. Perfect. So, anything which is 90 and 180 will be with or against total elastigmatism. We also give a leverage of around 10 to 15 diopters. Normally, up to 15 diopters on either side of 90 or 180 is still called as with or against. So, even if you have 80 and 170 also, we still call it as with or against. But if you have 45 degrees, then it's an oblique astigmatism and it is a mixed astigmatism. So if you give this and you give this, so this differentiation is what we call as transposition. I think we come to a very important aspect. So this is a very commonly asked in the exam is they give you a mixed astigmatism and they ask you to transpose it. So transposition of a spiro cylinder is a very important aspect in refraction and it is always asked in the exam. So how do you do a transposition? The transposition is algebraic sum of the sphere and the cylinder. Algebraic sum means you do along with the signs. You do an algebraic sum and you keep the cylinder value as it is, chain the sign of the cylinder to the other one and make the axis perpendicular to the present axis. Okay. So let us go with this. It is plus 1 minus 5.25. So, the algebraic sum will be minus 4.25 sphere. Got it? 
then the cylinder becomes plus 5.25 45 will become 135 so it will be this value okay so this value versus this value this is the transposed value of this so again algebraic sum of the sphere and cylinder put it as the sphere keep the cylinder as it is change the sign and make the axis perpendicular to the present axis okay so now i want to ask you dr rajeshri or dr babita is here <coughs> any of them babita rajeshri hello dr. sir dr babita right babita you are there yes sir yes sir okay dr babita i ask you a question this value and this value which one you want to prescribe to the patient sir uh... I want to prescribe uh, plus one and the minus uh, plus one sphere and minus two point five cylinder with forty five degree. Not this, not this, right? Which is a plus yes, cylinder. Sir. Okay. Yes, so uh, you should know basically why we ask for a transposition. Okay. So most yes, of the people think that it's better to give the cylinder in the negative cylinder form. Okay. Yes, sir. But you should understand whether you give this value. For this value, the final glasses will be same. The optical effect for what the patient sees will be same because it is like two plus two or four, <clears throat> both mean the same arithmetically, right? So yes. the final effect, whether you give this prescription or this prescription, will be the same. But still, why do we actually give it in negative cylinder? It is not for any other thing. It is to basically make the making of glasses easy okay so if we give want to make this glass okay with our opticians they have to grind a piece of a block of glass to this value right they don't have this value as a inventory stock it's a very complex and a very unusual number so they'll have to make it they have to grind it when they grind it to the machine the grinding machine they need to always input the cylinder in the negative form the machine takes the cylinder value always in the negative form if there's a plus value you need to transpose it and put it in the negative value okay so you don't let those people transpose it and make mistakes rather you transpose and give the value in the negative cylinder form so that it is easy if they are making the glasses from a new block if it is a ready made glass for example it is a minus 1 sphere minus 1 cylinder okay or uh, something like you know plus two sphere plus one I mean uh, plus one cylinder you don't have to convert into a negative cylinder because they are usually available as inventory glasses they can cut and fit it directly <clears throat> so <clears throat> you need to understand as a uh, convention we would like to give especially high cylinders in the negative cylinder form so as to make the thing easier okay so uh, dr babita can you answer this there are the example of a mixed astigmatism, there are four options. Which is the correct option? Uh, a for Ahmedabad, B for Bombay, C for Chennai, D for Delhi. Sir, this, uh, C. It's C, I think. B for Chennai? Not yes, B, sir. not A. So if you actually transpose this, if you transpose this, it becomes a plus cylinder. If you transpose this, it becomes a compound hyperopic astigmatism. Yes, sir. So this is a, just a simple astigmatism. So you yes, should sir. know that for a mixed astigmatism, the cylinder value has to be always more than the sphere value. Yes, you get the point? So, yes, if it's a mixed astigmatism, only and only if the cylinder value should be more than the sphere value. If it is less or equal, then it becomes either a simple or a compound astigmatism, not a mixed astigmatism. So, this is something you should keep it in mind, right? Yes. Okay, so this is the value. And let us say these are the two, this is a mixed astigmatism, you all agree, and it's an oblique astigmatism. So if I ask you to transpose this, okay, let us say a plus two and minus 3.5. So it becomes minus 1.5 plus 3.5 cylinder 
and what is the axis? What is the axis? 30. 30? 30? 37. 37? So you took around 10 seconds to do this. So let me teach you how to do it in a one second. So this is 37. So you had a trouble. If it is 90, it's 180. It is 45, it's 135. You know that. If it is a little odd number. So how to get the corresponding axis? For example, this one. This will be, what is the axis? I'm counting seconds. 153. 153. So the thing is, how to get the perpendicular axis is, if it is a three-digit number, add the first two numbers, then you get the perpendicular axis. If it is 178, add 1 plus 7, it becomes 88. If it is a double-digit number, break the number into 1 and the remaining number, like 1, 5 becomes 1 and 4, 143. If it is 29, it becomes 119. So you can guess the perpendicular. 123 becomes how much? 33. 28 becomes? 173 becomes? 83. 11 becomes? 101. 101. 101. 79 becomes? 156, 66. 67 is 157. So you can get to know all this. So with this, we come to know the objective correction. So we do a retinoscopy and we find the objective evaluation of the refraction. So the refraction whatever is the refractive status of the eye, we need to objectively find out. So we use the retinoscope to find the two meridia where it neutralizes, then we make an acceptance. We cannot prescribe the same glass to the patient because the patient has to accept it. So we have to take a trial frame, try these glasses until the patient gets the best corrected visual acuity to his satisfaction. So that is called a subjective verification or subjective refraction. Okay, so Dr. Vishal, before I start that, Dr. Kilani is here. I'm very happy to actually see him here. Hello, sir, Dr. Kamlesh. Good evening, sir. Nice to hear you. I mean, see you on the this platform once again virtually. Uh, so, to your comments from you before I start the second part. I will just unmute him. Uh, yes, you have. Yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay, first of all, I welcome you to this virtual meeting. If you recall, you have been to Jaipur. Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> and you have spoken on this very same topic. Very fond memories. Yes, sir. That was a, very appreciated by the residents at that time. I hope they will enjoy this time also. And it has been a great initiative by ROS Ch Chairman Scientific Committee, Dr. Vishal. I congratulate him uh, for this endeavor. I hope he will continue to do the good job which he has started. With this, I again extend a warm welcome to you. And I hope you will, uh, your lecture will enrich our resident immensely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Very, very nice of you, sir. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, can I go ahead with uh, the next part, Please, sir. Please, sir. Okay. So we have, uh, you know, two slots for the grand prize also. Whenever you feel like, you can just drop in those questions. <laughs> sure. Okay. So now we'll... Uh, uh, so I was just telling that we just have finished our objective refraction. So we have come to know what is the uh, meridia and what is the neutralization points. And we also have theoretically found out what should be the acceptance. If the patient is not able to subjectively cooperate, then we have to give it objective refraction only. For in children who cannot objectively I mean, cooperate or pre-verbal children or people who cannot understand. So in such patients, we actually have to give the objective correction. But in most patients, 
it is not the right thing to prescribe that we need to actually put those glasses on the trial frame because there are so many variations from the objective to what the actual patient actually can accept it so that is something that you all should know that there is a, a difference in that so we need to actually verify the objective the refraction and do it subjectively so that the patient finally gets what actually he sees clearly so subjective verification of refraction is a very important thing and i'll start with something which most of you are not using and actually should be using okay so let me start with what is called astigmatic dial or astigmatic fan it's one of the most elegant <clears throat> yet very simple and a quick method of discerning the cylinders okay so what is that so let me just take you through this so this is a simple astigmatic fan you can all make it with a paint program you can take an a4 sheet make some paint program and keep it there like radiating lines like the clock hours or like sun rays okay it's a simple thing you can just stick it to your uh, examination room and use it as even if you don't have one you can make one right so how do we use the astigmatic dial <clears throat> first of all so what is the use of it it is to basically look for an uncorrected cylinder or to refine an existing cylinder so if you are doing a refraction subjectively let us say the patient with your whatever you have found out objectively you put it on the trial frame <clears throat> the patient is six six parts you have put a cylinder but a six six part or you have put a sphere and you think that there could be a cylinder which you have not picked it up right so there's a cylinder which is lurking out there or to refine the existing cylinder so we just want to know and it's a small cylinder it's not a very large cylinder a small cylinder otherwise the patient won't be six six parts so this is for the fine verification of a presence of a cylinder or for refining the cylinder value and always always all subjective verification be it astigmatic dial be it jackson's cross cylinder be it binocular balance you need to do a fogging so this is very important okay i'll again start with dr ayushi dr ayushi what do you think is the need for fogging what is the actual role of fogging in any subjective correction theek hai so you have seen that ad no kya chal raha hai so normally fog chal raha hai so why this fogging is so important can you give me the reasons or do you really know what fogging actually mean you are around dr ayushi gupta i'll just check okay otherwise dr sangam should be fine yeah sir to relax the accommodation we have to fog the patient why should you relax the accommodation What if they accommodate? The myopic, uh, hypermetropic patients usually uh, use their accommodation to see the uh, distant vision. So you mean myopic patients won't accommodate? No, sir. Sir, they use less their accommodation. Myopic patients because they already are, have the. And if you are refracting a myopic child, you don't have to do fogging. No, sir. We have to do fogging in myopic also. yes so basically there are two reasons to do fogging fogging is simply putting a plus 1 or a plus 1.5 diopter sphere just put it to the trial frame that's fogging so what does fogging do two things number one as you said the patient in trying to see clearly can actually accommodate and disturb the final reading if the patient is myopic let us say because always accommodation adds a minus power to the a refraction okay for example a myopic you may overestimate myopia the patient has to stop at minus 2 let's say if you accommodate you may probably end up giving a minus 3 correction and hypermetropian always tend to un get under corrected if a patient has plus 4 sphere if he accommodates you may end up giving plus 3 sphere right so fogging basically tries to discourage accommodation because if the patient accommodates they will see more blood so they will not accommodate so plus sphere or a plus 1.5 sphere is a good way to retard or discourage accommodation the second thing is what is the practical reason is when you want to compare in a subjective correction the vision cannot be six six parts if the vision is six six parts and if he is asked to compare between six six parts and six six the difference is not much 
so patient sometimes may be confused about what is the right thing both may look the same but if you reduce the vision to 612 or 618 then the difference in the vision or the improvement will be very obvious they can discern it or identify it in a much better way so any subjective correction the vision should not be near to 66 it should be less so actually adding a plus lens will reduce the vision to 612 or 618 i think all these things are doable it's a do it yourself refraction so from tomorrow pick up your friends or any volunteer or a patient and try whatever i'm going to tell you in this class you will know that it all works that way right so you fog the patient then ask the patient to look at the astigmatic dial and ask him to report of all the lines radiating lines which are the clearer or darker lines okay so you have some lines are darker because obviously there are lines on the uh, astigmatic dial when you put a plus 1 or 1.5 the vision drops to 618 so the lines become blurred all the lines will become blurred but if he sees some of the lines clearer than the other or darker than the other he need to know on what axis they are clearer that means there is a negative cylinder that you need to use along this axis till all the lines appear equally blurred or equally clear okay so this is the whole steps of using an astigmatic dial so let me start then you remove the fog and see whether that really works on the subjective correction it's just a clue see astigmatic dial is a clue that there is a cylinder along this axis it is your duty to actually check it up after removing the fog so let us say this is what you normally see when you are six six parts all of them are looking same now i put a plus 1.5 fog then this is what you see right you see there are horizontal line at 180 the lines are clearer and the other lines have become blurred because the vision has dropped to 680 that means there is a negative cylinder along 180 degrees which is maybe 0.25 or 0.5 negative so we need to remove the fog and check is there a cylinder that really exists so somebody who six six parts if you put a negative cylinder on 180 degrees maybe 0.5 he may actually move to 66 or 65 so this is how we use astigmatic dial so very importantly this is basically for fogging asking to do clearer lines then use the negative cylinder along the axis till all of them become equally blurred or equally clear okay so now comes another important thing which most of the postgraduates do not do or do not know do not use is binocular balance so we were just discussing about how accommodation actually plays havoc in a subjective correction see it's very important that when you put in cycloplegia the accommodation is relaxed you get values but that is not how we see in real life world we have an active accommodation so you need to do a pmt or do a dry refraction when the accommodation is actually active right but if the patient is accommodating and if it is unequal when you are checking then it becomes actually a problem right so the binocular balance what is the use of binocular balance it is basically to relax the accommodation equally when you are checking both eyes so let me give you some idea why this is actually required i'll give a real life example there's a patient a child of 10 years who comes to you for glasses he has minus 2 in both eyes okay a simple refraction minus 2 sphere only so when you are checking the right eye you are actually blocking the left eye with the occluder that is how we check vision so you block the left eye and start giving correction to the right eye he accepts minus 2 and read 66 now what you do is you occlude the right eye now and start doing the subjective correction for the left eye and this boy now accommodates for whatever reason let us say accommodates one diopter so that he accepts minus 3 instead of minus 2 right so you give a correction of minus 2 in the right eye and minus 3 in the left eye now this boy makes glasses and he comes back and says he is not able to see clearly why because when he is not accommodating he sees clearly with the right eye 
and he sees blurred with the left eye because it's over corrected if he accommodates one diopter he sees clearly with the left eye and see blurred with the right eye the vision is not equally clear in both eyes at any point of time because you cannot accommodate asymmetrically you cannot accommodate only in the left eye and not accommodate in the right eye it's equal and symmetrical in both eyes but how do you check vision of both eyes simultaneously it is not possible <clears throat> it is possible if you dissociate the vision of both the eyes using a vertical prism so you have this a this is a 12 prism diopters vertical prism whichever way so you can use it in your trial frame so all your uh, i mean trial sets have this in the trial set so this is for binocular balance so tomorrow you can actually check this out so when you are doing a trial the correction put this and the page you will be very surprised to see that the patient can read two charts simultaneously one from the left eye one from the right eye because the vision of the two eyes have been dissociated so now you know which chart he is reading from the right eye which chart he is reading from the left eye so this is one opportunity where you can compare the vision of both eyes simultaneously using a vertical prism so how do you do that it is very simple for example if this boy who was actually accommodated only in one eye if you want to put a vertical prism before we give the prescription so now he is seeing with both eyes you are not occluded one eye so if he accommodates one vision will be clear other will be blurred if it does not accommodate the other will be clear this will be blurred and here also you need to fog the patient okay like minus 2 right eye minus 3 left eye you put a fog of plus 1 then put a vertical prism then you will have two charts one for the right eye one for the left eye compare the two and both should be equally blurred or equally clear if there's a difference he is reading 612 in one and he is reading 660 in the other then there's an unequal accommodation then you need to find out what has gone wrong so binocular balance technique is a simple elegant and a very quick method you just did this takes half a minute to do this so that in children who are actually accommodating very very robustly i mean the, the accommodate is very active it's very difficult to suppress accommodation you can actually check this out and so that you will not get into trouble when you are prescribing glasses especially in hyperactive children and now come the duochrome test this is a very common test very commonly asked and in the exam as well as in real life we use this so this is something most people are actually are used to but you should understand that the duochrome test can distinguish small difference in the sphere okay not large spheres for example if somebody is minus 2 okay and you have put minus 1 it is not a duochrome test it should be very small less than or equal to 0.5 adapters only so so what we saw both now was we actually use the astigmatic dial to refine the cylinder axis okay and we use the binocular balance to see that accommodation is equal and symmetrical and now duochrome test is to refine the power of the sphere it is to refine the sphere okay and it cannot be used in persons with a vision less than 69 if somebody has got a 636 vision you can't use duochrome test very satisfactorily we can use it with both eyes open or occluding one eye it can be used in the color blind also because it is not the actual color discrimination it is the hue that is more important or which is brighter that is more important not the exact color discrimination and we finally tell you all the post grad to use a mnemonic which is called ram gap that means a duochrome test okay it duochrome test if you are seeing right red brighter okay then you need to add minus is an undercorrected myope so you need to add minus or subtract plus so ram is red is brighter add minus if the green is brighter you add plus so this is the simplest thing it is based on chromatic aberration and this test which is available in all the vision charts okay is a very simple technique and it is a very commonly used technique and also commonly asked in the exam so try to understand duochrome test do it in your practice so that it becomes a, a like a back of your hand okay so can anybody tell me any of the pgs who are actually uh, they put their audio on 
can tell me what is the use of a stenopics stick or you can just uh, add your message to the chat box also yeah, that's also fine and look at the spelling is very important this is the spelling of the stenopic slate so stenopic slate is an elongated pinhole okay it's got a very uh, it's used in identifying what is the principal axis of refraction in scarred corneas or in patients with irregular astigmatism okay you see a lot of corneal uh, injury patients who undergo suturing corneal tear repair all that and they end up with scars on the cornea especially the central part of the cornea and when they come there their vision is very poor if they have a corneal scar in the center their vision will be hardly counting in that 2 meters or 1 meter even though the rest of the eye is absolutely normal okay so the rest of the cornea is clear but the corneal scar or the nebula or an irregular astigmatism would have i mean decimated the vision completely and you cannot put them on the auto refractometer there will be no reading that comes from the auto refractometer if you want to do an objectively retinoscopy you don't get any reflexes properly okay so now then how do we refract them subjectively so what you do is you dilate the those patients and try to put the stenopic slit so you put the stenopic slit and see that you keep on actually moving that uh so that you put a stenopic slit and ask them to move it themselves at one particular axis of the stenopic slit they see the their vision improves <clears throat> that means that is one of the axis the principal axis of refraction let us say it is 135 then along 135 put plus lenses plus cylinders or minus cylinders you try trial and error so you start he sees better with a minus cylinder let's say you keep it minus 1 minus 2 minus 3 so then along then you add spheres empirically plus 1 sphere or minus 1 sphere plus 2 sphere or minus 2 sphere and you can come to know by doing this trial and error you can actually find out with this correction they may see better a vision of 2 meters or 2 by 60 it can improve to 6 by 60 which is of great use so at the same time if you are trying to do an optical arachidectomy for a central corneal scar or a aberrant leucoma so to understand which is the axis which has the least aberrations you can use this the the axis along which the patient sees clearly in a stenopic slit that is the axis you need to open the iris and make an iridectomy not wherever the iris is present okay so most of the times we do superior temporally or superior nasally but if that may be the axis which has a higher aberrations than the other so you need to detect which is the axis in which there is a least the vision is best and try to do an optical iridectomy along that axis okay and finally we come to the very important aspect that is the jcc or the jackson's cross cylinder jackson's cross cylinder is well known to all examiners it's a toy that is always kept on the viva table and you are going to be asked questions about cross cylinder so what is this cross cylinder we use this to refine the axis as well as the power right and we have to basically again do the fogging as i told you any subjective correction you need to do the fogging because you need to know the difference in the improvement or is the worsening okay that is what that's why vision cannot be six six parts so what you do is i'll try to simply tell you the procedure first and then try to explain it to you in a different in a more detailed way so you already have a sphere at the cylinder in the trial frame okay let us say you have a minus 1 sphere you have a minus 1 cylinder at 90 degrees so this minus 1 cylinder is the test cylinder it is already that we are testing it so now we want to know whether this minus 1 cylinder at 90 is the correct cylinder is it the correct axis so first you refine the axis always okay so what you do is you take the cross cylinder the cross cylinder has it's basically a spiro cylinder in which the cylindrical power is always double the spherical value so that and it's of a opposite sign for example if this plus 0.5 diopter sphere minus what cylinder at 90 or 180 so when you do a, a spherical equivalent of a cross cylinder the spherical equivalent of any spiro cylinder is you divide this cylinder value by half 
do an algebraic sum with sphere. Okay, so plus 0.5 minus one cylinder. So the algebraic sum will be zero. That means the algebraic sum or the spherical equivalent of a cross cylinder is always zero. So if you put a cross cylinder to any patient having a particular value, the final visual acuity won't change because the spherical equivalent is zero. So when you straddle the test cylinder, means the green line is the plus cylinder and the red line is the minus cylinder. So you put it in such a way that it, st it straddles the, if it is at 90 degrees, then let us say the green one comes at 135, the red one comes at 45. That means it straddles on either side of the test cylinder. Okay. And ask the patient to look at the vision chart. The vision would have dropped to let's say 612 or 618. Ask him to see the chart and remember it. And then you flip the cross cylinder. You turn it by 180 degrees so that the green which was on the right side becomes the left and the red which was on the left becomes the right. So it basically changes their position. They chart the positions and ask the patient to again see at the test, I mean the vision chart and to remember which of these two position was clearer. Okay. Then note the position of the clearer vision. That means where is the plus and where is the minus. Then you need to move the test cylinder along the cross cylinder of the same sign. Okay, so let me explain the last part. The test cylinder is a minus cylinder, right? So in the first position, the minus was at 45 and plus was at 35. And the patient saw clearer in this position. That means since the test cylinder is minus and the negative cylinder was at 45, you need to move the test cylinder along the 45, towards the 45 degrees by around five to seven degrees, not more. Okay, so fine refinement of that. That means you need to slightly move it towards the negative cylinder. Okay, or the, that is the cylinder of the same sign. That is the position in which he sees clearly. So this is how you need to actually understand the JCC. And the best part is you actually start doing it. Catch hold of your friend who is wearing glasses, refracted friend, and try to use JCC. You will come to know that all these things actually work. If you keep doing it, it becomes so easy, you will be very confident to answer in the exam. And I'll tell you, the examiners will be very happy if you know these basics well and know them confidently. Just not by, I mean, doing a by heart and going to the exam. You actually do it. It's actually do it yourself types. All these, whatever I've told you, the subjective correction, you can do it on patients, you can do it on volunteers, <clears throat> you can do it on yourself to see whether they all work. Okay, so I'll give you some tips for a subjective refraction. The end point of refraction, see, this is the probably the most important sentence of today's class. The end point of refraction is the strongest plus, the weakest minus, which gives maximum visual acuity. Why is this? Can any of the postgraduate tell me why this sentence is very important? Why it has to be the strongest plus and the weakest minus? Anybody? Sir, in hypermetrop, if we give the strongest plus, then they will use their less uh, accommodation to see the distant vision. And in myops, we will give them less minus numbers so that they can use their accommodation. Yes. More. So basically, if you give a strongest plus or the weakest minus, you are allowing the accommodation to be free to be used for near. You should understand accommodation is a very tricky thing. We have been endowed with accommodation to be used for near vision, not for distant vision. So in sometimes we use it for distance and spoil the whole scene. A hyperopes use accommodation for distance and they start seeing clearly and they can eliminate some amount of hyperopia or even fully correct it. But that is an abnormal usage. It's an abuse. It's a misuse. Similarly, my, uh, myopes, if they accommodate, then they end up actually increasing their minus. 
So if you give strongest plus, the patient need not use accommodation to correct his hyperopia. It will be left for to be used for near. Same with minus. For example, if you give less plus, the patient is forced to use accommodation for the remaining amount. If you use higher minus, then the patient has to accommodate to cover up for the extra concave length that you have used. That means in both the situations, the patient is forced to use accommodation unnecessarily. At the same time, it has to be a maximum visual activity. That is very important. So if you can really believe this and try to follow this, you will not go wrong. The patient will be very comfortable because he's not forced to use accommodation all the time. You verify the cylinder with a cross cylinder or astigmatic dial. Verify the spear with a duochrome test and verify and balance both eyes using a binocular balance technique. So this one slide will give you the overall idea about how should you go about subjective refraction. And this has to be followed on patients to get familiarized with this technique. Okay, there are a few tips I would like to add. Never change well-adjusted glasses needlessly. Okay, just because the patient says, patient is fine, don't because there are so many things, the vertex distance, the frame, the spatial orientation, everything will suddenly change, especially higher numbers, complex refraction, high cylinders, don't change the well-adjusted glasses. Never prescribe a large cylinder for the first time. Okay, for example, a patient comes, okay, he has not used glasses, he has his plus two spear, minus four cylinder, 90. Okay. So you do the auto refractometer and just put it there and you prescribe the classes. Patient says, let's say 612. This patient will never get used to this minus four cylinder because it's a first time. Okay. Then you go and check again. It was plus two sphere and with minus three cylinder also he's 612. Minus four cylinder also he's 612. So you need to give the least cylinder which is compatible with best corrected visual activity. So she would be more happy with minus three cylinder rather than minus four cylinder. Okay. But this may not apply to pseudophakics and children. They tend to tolerate high cylinders compared to phakics and adult patients. And nowadays, never prescribe a high reading addition. Earlier, when we were postgraduates, for all cataract patients, monofocal patients, we would always give okay, a high plus three addition. Okay, Dr. Kilani others will probably remember plus three because patients were reading small print close to their, I mean, uh, their eyes and reading was the main thing. But now people read from screens. People use different fonts. People have a high contrast screen. So they don't need plus three. That will make them keep the their mobile very close to their face, which is not a, a physiological thing. So nowadays, even with pseudophakic patients, plus 2.5 is a better option than plus 3, except in some special cases. You also have to reassess the need for bifocals in myopes. A lot of myopes, especially slightly undercorrected myopes in the pre presbyopic age group, are very comfortable with monofocals. So let us say a patient wearing, let's say, minus 3.5. He's 37 years. He's 6, 9 for distance and N6 for near. He comes for glasses and you find that if you hike his number to 4.5, he'll be 6.5. So you give his correction to 4.5 and say that, okay, your vision has improved, go. And this man, since his number has been increased by minus one, he will suddenly start developing problem to read small print. Okay. So sometimes then he may actually require an additional plus number as a bifocal or a progressive to see clearly. So you have to always check the near vision in any patient, regardless of the age. So that's why the last point is use near vision as a guide to prescribe high myopic correction. So let me give you a small example to quote this point. You go to a school for a school screening, let us say, and you find a boy who is 10 years who's having minus 10 diopter 
in both eyes. He is a high myope, neglected, not used glasses. Okay, so you'll be very happy that you read a refraction minus ten. He is actually reading, let us say, six twelve. So you give minus ten for him and come back happy that he's go. You have cleared a vision of a boy who has never used glasses. This boy will never use this minus ten at all. You know why? Because this boy has never used his accommodation in his life. Because if he uses his accommodation, his myopia will increase. So his near vision will become more blurred. So this man's accommodation, this boy's accommodation, is completely underutilized or become you know completely rusted. So once you give minus ten. He suddenly cannot accommodate to see N six. This his accommodation takes some time to recover. So if you had checked the near vision of this boy, you would have understood this. Normally, we don't check near vision in small kids or young people or pre-preschool people. So if minus ten you give, he read is six twelve for distance, but near vision is N thirty two because he is not used maybe using accommodation. So from minus ten, you reduce it to minus nine. His vision drops to let us say six thirty six. He becomes let's say n eighteen. You drop it to minus eight, then his vision becomes let's say six sixty or three by sixty, and he's n eight. Now you should prescribe minus eight for him, not minus ten. Whatever is his near vision, what is compatible with good near vision, even though it is an under correction for him, give minus eight. This boy will use glasses, and over a period of time, his accommodation will recover. Then you can hike it to minus nine or minus ten the subsequent day. So this is the whole idea. So always check near vision in children also as a routine. You never know. Lot of children have accommodative lack. Lot of children have hypo accommodation. I am a strabismologist. We see lot of patients what we call as hypo accommodative convergence excess. Lot of people come with convergent convergence or convergent squint for near. We think that they are hyper accommodating, high AC per ratio. No, their near point of accommodation is actually very remote. They have poor accommodation. As children, they have poor accommodation, so they tend to over accommodate, even though it does not happen. But the convergence kicks in, and they have. excessive convergence because of poor accommodation so which we call as hypo accommodative convergence excess so never oh, i mean uh, i mean uh, take it for granted that all children will have normal accommodation okay just like over accommodation like in high ac by ratio is a problem even hypo accommodation is also a problem in children okay especially children who are very lethargic who are actually sick who are undernourished these are the children who can actually have hypo accommodation so keep that in mind okay so remember what is called as over refraction what is over refraction see this is one uh, thing that i wanted to tell you people if somebody comes with glasses wearing glasses and you want to know whether their glasses are correct or not okay so what you can do is you can actually do the retinoscopy on their own glasses on their own glasses so if you do a retinoscopy on their own glasses not on any trial frame not on any trial glasses so with their glasses if they are emetrope there will be a width movement at two thirds meters if you put plus 1.5 and under and over refract there will be a neutralization so the simplest way to know is somebody wearing the right glass or not okay So put a plus one point five over their spectacle, uh, touching their spectacle, and do a retinoscopy. You will have a neutralization. So this simple over refraction can solve the problem of you trying to know that they are wearing the glasses which actually they should wear. At the same time, over refraction is a terminology that we use in contact lens. so when you put a trial contact lens you always refract over the contact lens and to see what is the residual hyperopia or myopia that should be factored in to give the final refraction the final contact lens power okay for example you may think that the minus 4 the patient comes with minus 4 you want to give me contact lens so you may put minus 4 contact lens but when you over refract 
okay you get a hyper op of plus 0.5 that means you need to subtract that from the contact lens power and give minus 3.5 not minus 4 so over refraction is something that you should know and you should actually be adept in trying to do this using a uh, streak retinoscope and the vertex distance is very important see whatever refraction uh, refractive power we give it is only compatible with a known vertex distance a predetermined vertex distance for example if you are saying my myopic error is minus 1 it is for a particular what it's at minus 12 mm let's say it's at 12 mm from the eye if my spectacle is sitting at 12 mm then it is minus 1 if it moves away or if it moves in then the number changes so vertex distance can make a big difference a simple example is if your eye wall power is plus 20 if the contact lens for an aphakic patient will be plus 13 and the aphakic glasses will be plus 10 you got the point that means this is the vertex distance from the nodal point if the plus lens moves away it becomes more and more powerful okay that means a plus 10 glasses would be same as plus 13 contact lens would be same as plus 20 or 22 intraocular lens in the back so this is the effect of vertex distance and it also has a role in contact lens practice for example if you are having minus 10 refractive error then your contact lens will be minus 9 okay it is actually less so understand the importance of vertex distance that's why some people suddenly don't get used to the new glasses they have been wearing some glass for a long time you prescribe a new glass they will go and buy a new frame which is sitting at a much different distance than their old glasses because of the frame fitting onto their face so that will have a, the same number won't work there so this is something and the and the trial frame that you put on the eye also has to be something which is uh, of a, from a normal distance from the eye you cannot put it too much away or too much close to the eye so that your values can be different especially in higher powers and uh, why it is 2 by okay i'll uh, dr vishal whoever answers this question we can award them a prize tell me why we prefer 2/3 meter not 1 meter or half meter or 2 meters you can drop in your answer in the chat box okay we can do that then i'll leave this unanswered we'll probably if it not answered in this time we can take it up in the next class also okay and finally i told you i am a stabismologist i am very much touchy about patients having four years or latent stabismus so if a patient any amount of exo deviation any tendency of exo deviation whether it is exophoria or intermittent divergent squint or any kind of divergent stabismus always fully correct myopia and under correct hyperopia so this is the standard statement all exo deviations fully correct myopia and under correct hypermetropia whereas all eso deviation tendencies whether it is esophoria or eso deviation fully correct hyperopia and under correct myopia so that you are actually helping the patient not to start a new refractive problem so you will not create a ref i mean a muscular asthenopia okay i'll start a new problem for the patient so this is a standard statement which you have to understand okay i think uh, <clears throat> i will stop here i think i have a quiz uh, yes sir i have a quiz which i'll uh, start any comments from the elite panel that we have we have a lot of teachers here dr rakesh sir any comments on your part dr jayshree madam yeah yeah Sir, good evening, sir. 
Yeah, please. Uh, the role of retinoscopy has gone down far away for the new residents. How can we motivate them to do retinoscopy? Most of my residents, I tell them every day, see, this is the bread and butter of yours for the initial years of their life. But they never want to do retinoscopy. They go directly on auto -ramp. So how can we, in spite of many requests to them, they do not follow this instruction and they just keep doing with auto -ramp. So how can we motivate with them the things? That is the problem. See, basically, the postgraduates are only learning refraction to pass the exam. Very sad. Because as I told you in the beginning itself, the biggest examiner is the patient sitting in front of you. You will never understand. See, the, the, I think for all the postgraduates, I have a very important uh, statement. Our patients think that giving glasses is very easy and doing cataract surgery is very difficult. In fact, in practice, it's the reverse. Our postgrads are very good with cataract surgery. They don't know how to give a complex refraction. If the patient, if you dissatisfy a patient with a bad refraction, then you do a complex refraction, give correction. Patient goes and spends 20,000 on his new spectacle frame and glass, and it turns out to be wrong. Do you think that he will be very, I mean, merciful on you? He will think that he can't even give glasses. What surgery he will do? He will tell 1,000 people that this man can't even give glasses. I spent, I, I wasted my 20,000. Don't go to him for anything. Okay. He doesn't know that our PGs are very good in cataract, not in refraction. So it is a common place. And second thing, refraction is the, or the, uh, it's the basic function of the eye. Our eye refracts light rays and focuses on the thing. So that is how our eye works. Unless you really understand how to correct the basic refractive problems of the eye and how it is interlinked to every subspeciality. Be it refractive surgery, be it cataract surgery, be it retina, be it anything. Our refraction is an integral part. Coming to your question of retinoscopy, creating a passion. I think if you don't learn refraction or subjective or objective refraction, you become a slave in the hands of autorefractometers and optometrists in future. If your auto ref doesn't work properly, it gives bizarre reading, if there's no power, if it conks off, and your optometrist gives wrong readings, the, the onus is on you. You are the face of the hospital. You are the people are coming in your name and you have to give the right glasses. You can't say my optometrist did the wrong thing. The vicarious liability lies on you. So if your refraction is your strong point, you can rule over your optometrist, you can rule over out of refractive because you don't have to depend on them. But the common excuse given is that the government, uh, you know, medical colleges, the OPD is very heavy and retinoscopy takes time and the yard does it uh, far uh, quicker. So that is the most common excuse given actually. In fact, that is the plus point. The very thing that you have patients, you have those guinea pigs, you have people to actually to experiment on. Okay. There are colleges where there are no patients, where you can't do anything. You have to have volunteers or do it on yourself. You have patients, no? So you try that you become a strong point. When you have patients, you can learn every skill, not just retinoscopy. You can learn gonioscopy. You can learn 90D, IDO. You can learn every skill on those patients because they're wanting you to see them. So why not you use that opportunity? When you have more patients, it's actually a plus point that you are given an opportunity to learn these skills. And post-graduation is the best time to learn. Once it gets grounded now, you will become really so confident in future that nobody can shake you. I think that of all the things, I feel a good solid refraction basics is going to see you through in most of the problems. And I told you whatever problem I told you, the postgraduate don't face it. See, they are under the umbrella of the institution. They are not accountable or answerable to patients. It's a low stake situation. Okay, when they come into practice, when the patient is buying a spectacle of 30,000 in a branded shop, your refraction has to be right. Otherwise, he will ask you to re reimburse the 30,000 because you gave a wrong prescription. Right? It's a high stake. And also, you will have a bad name. He will not prefer you for anything in future. So your refraction becomes a defining point. You can't say that I'm good in other things, not refraction. 
Uh, sir, second thing I want to ask you, sir, uh, what is the role of foropter today that to a present scenario? Foropter. The foropter is a good toy, little costly, and if you get used to it, it is one of the fantastic things. It saves so much time. Foropter, see, but you don't have to have a foropter. Foropter is basically an automation in your trial frame and classes. If you are regularly doing subjective correction yourself, then you can buy a foropter and get used to it. You also have to, it's like, you know, buying a Mercedes, you should also spend some time trying to learn how to drive it. Not everybody can run a Mercedes directly. So foropter is a very uh, cheesy thing. You need to really spend some time to know how to use it. I mean, it's like a, uh, I mean, buying a new Apple phone uh, 14 where you need to really understand how it works. It really takes some time to use the, all the as, I mean, aspects and the, I mean, the advantages of the new phone. Similarly, for after is also a machine. It may look little difficult in the beginning, but once you get used to it, you'll start liking it. But it is not necessary. It is a costly toy and you may not have to do it. If you do it with a trial frame, that is good enough. So I think we have still some time, 10 minutes. Yes, sir. We have 10 minutes. You okay. Can just... Then I just go through some of the questions. Uh, I think uh, all the uh, things they can probably, the postgraduates can shout out. Postgraduates, you can just shout out or drop in your answers in the chat box. How much time should we give them? 30 seconds per question? Huh? How much time I should we give? Oh, as per the question, I'll just uh, change it. <laughs> You're seeing it? Yes, sir. We can see it now. So let's start the uh, last 10 minutes or postgraduates can wake up and answer these questions. So this is a very common that thing. That is C. 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 Yeah, perfect. So basically, Bernard Storm, he is a, a classical arrangement of light rays. When the light passes through his speed oscillator. Great. So the simplest for the first. So who can answer this? Tell me. This is, I think Vishal, you have to give them a prize. Whoever answers it first. Okay, sir. I'll give you only last 10 seconds to answer. One, two, three. No movement. A, hey, no movement. A, hey, sorry, A, hey, no movement. No movement. No movement. I think no prize also. See, <laughs> let me just tell you. <laughs> at six, six, 66 centimeters, for a patient who is myopic by one point, there will be no movement, right? Correct? So at one meter, since the patient is myopic by 1.5 and your myopia at one will be one diopter, so there will be still against movement. That means at 66, the movement stops. At one meter, still it is against the rule, I mean against movement. 75 is in between the two. So it will be an against movement. Okay. So this is a little tricky. Both mathematics and optics both put together. So nobody gets this. It's an against movement, right? So this is about prism diopters. Now, when you see a target through a prism of five prism diopters at a distance of two meters and shoots at the target, will he hit the target, misses it by five centimeters, 10 centimeters, or 2.5 centimeters? So you have five seconds to answer this. There's nothing in this, it's just a calculation. So nobody gets this. See, what is a prism diopter? It moves an object 
at one meter by a distance of one centimeter. If you see an object at one meter, if you see through a prism, it is moved by one meter, one milli, one centimeter. So he is seeing through five feet by prism diameters at a distance of two meters. Then obviously it will move by ten centimeters. Okay, he will miss it by ten centimeters because it is five prism diameters and two meters, right? So I think this I have already asked. Gear point of convergence is eight centimeters at eight years. What will be the near point of convergence at fourteen years? Four centimeters, twelve centimeters, fifteen centimeters, or none of the above? I think five seconds should be fine. Yes, sir. We have any answers? B. Anybody? At fourteen years. Uh, At five years, what will be the LPC? So we have all the answers A, B, C. B. Uh, B. So I think the youngsters normally vote nota in the elections. See, and nobody is taking nota also. Okay. So the question is very, very actually tricky. The near point of accommodation is the point closest to the eye that can be seen clearly with maximum accommodation, and near point of accommodation keeps on changing with age. It becomes remote with age. Okay, so NPA changes with age, whereas near point of convergence is standard or common or fixed for an individual. So it does not change with age. If NPC at is eight centimeter at eight years, even at fourteen years, it will be eight centimeters only. You get the point. Yes, NPA sir. changes. NPC does not change unless patients who are deficient in convergence undergo some exercises. You may change it, but otherwise, normally it is fixed for an individual. So all answer should have voted nota. Would yes, sir. Ankita said nota D, so she will get the grand prize. Oh, all right. Said. I didn't hear that. Okay, right. So you just write nota in all elections. You will be right. <laughs> Can you transpose quickly A B C D fast? Simplest. Sir B. I think I told you just the sir, axis will do. B sir B. B B correct. B sir. So just one sixty three, one plus six seventy three is the answer. You got it right, right? So Ishita, Ishita got it first, right? Fastest finger first. Fastest vocal cord, right? Or fastest finger? Fastest vocal cord. So what is the answer? A B C D. The C. Huh? Curvature myopia. Are you? See, myopia due to early cataract is lentical myopia, index myopia. Cornea plana will cause hyperopia. Okay, that's myopia due to forward distance called positional myopia. Lenticonus is the one which will cause curvature myopia. Right? Both keratinous lenticonus curvature. Answer is B. Okay, so I think. Uh, we will finish with this question because this is a very important question i think we'll take the other questions in the second half of the or the uh, next class so we'll yes, finish sir. with this okay so 14 14.5 14.5 oh great Thanks. i think all of them should share the answer i mean share the prize before even i could put the question i mean answers so it's very easy to understand latent hyperopia is 1.5 And the minimum plus glasses is the absolute hypermetropia. Okay, so this is a an NP of ten centimeters means they have around ten. So it is ten plus three plus one point five. So we will try to answer this question by understanding how you actually you know understand hypermetropia and its different parts. The total hypermetropia is divided into latent. And manifest. 
latent is the amount of hypermetropia which is corrected by the normal tone of accommodation. And mind you, it is not same in every individual at every age. If you put atropine, we subtract one. It is just a uh, convention. For a young child, it may be 1.5. For an adult, it may be just 0.5 because the amount of later hypermetropia can also vary. Normally, it is 1 to 1.5. A near point of accommodation is the point closest to the that shall be seen clearly. That means the child has an accommodation of 10 diopters. Then over and above that, he accepts plus 3 means this is an absolute hypermetropia. That means in this child, 1.5 is latent hypermetropia, plus 10 diopters is facultative hypermetropia, that is the amount of hypermetropia which is corrected by the faculty of accommodation. And plus 3 is the absolute hypermetropia. So the overall hyperopic error would be plus 14.5. So that is a great answer. I'm very happy to finish it on a high note. Thank you very much, all the postgraduates. I think this was just an eye opener. This is just a beginning. And this should actually enthuse you to read more about the refraction. And in the next class, on the basis of this foundation, we will try to cover what is applied refraction in the sense how do you apply the refraction principles in cataract surgery, astigmatic astigmatism treatment, refractive surgery, retinal surgeries, okay, uh, multifocal eyeball implantation, okay, there are Absolutely. low vision aids, contact lens fitting. So there are so many aspects of a basic ophthalmic practice in which refraction is an integral part. And we are going to take up these clinical aspects so that you will understand refraction better and have a better you know, inclination to learn it much more. I think uh, I thank everyone, the entire always, as well as Dr. Vishal, Dr. Kildani, all the other people who are here and all the bright postgraduates who have made my day. Thank you very much for your patient hearing and for the opportunity given. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the exhaustive session. Your uh, throat must be terribly dry after speaking for more than one hour. <laughs> so this has been a wonderful uh, kaksha with a full house of uh, more than 140 participants to quick start an ambitious project of uh, PG teaching. Uh, thank you all residents, executive, faculty, and Dr. KP sir for the excellent teaching. Uh, we look forward uh, to your next class on the 21st, next week, next Wednesday with more residents on the hot seat. Thank you and keep giving your feedback also and suggestion on my number on the ROS email uh, for the Kaksha experience to improve uh, in the further classes. Dr. Gulam Ali, sir, any closing comments? It's nice. Uh, thank you, Dr. KP, uh, for nice presentation. Hope we will uh, meet on 21st again. Dr. Kilani, sir. So you have to unmute yourself, sir. I will do that, sir. Now you can uh, speak. Uh, it's a, always a pleasure to listen to him. It was as good as it was ever. I have listened to, I think, uh, almost 10 years back. And the refraction is, of course, of the great importance to everyone. But it has lost its sheen because of the autorefractometer. And now, as the glasses are, as you have already said, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, any dissatisfaction on the part of patient is uh, really comes on very heavily on you. So we have to be very particular. Don't leave it to your subordinates. Finally, you check it on, on you personally by yourself and it will save your day. I think many of us, we are have a very bitter memories about that. So thank you very much, sir. I hope you will, uh, there was some confusion regarding time. Mm -hmm. So I joined it little late. I'm sorry for that. I hope you, we will be in time no next time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good night, sir. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Mm -hmm. Good night, everyone. Good night. See you later. Okay, see you next Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the Canadian guys.